In this video, I want to look at the popular topic of object pooling and how to do it with bold visual scripting. This video will build on my function return video and will make use of super units that I created in that video. If you happen to miss that video, check the link in the top right or the video description below. For those who might not know the term or concept behind object pooling, you can basically think of object pooling as recycling and reusing game objects. It turns out that creating and destroying game objects is pretty expensive in terms of CPU usage. It's not a problem to create a few objects per frame, but if you're creating tens or hundreds of objects per frame, you can get huge lag spikes. For example, in my current personal project, I have a procedural spaceship generation script that can place 10, 20, or even a couple hundred separate modules in a single frame. This caused sizable lag spikes and made the game feel rough and unresponsive. For an action game, these lag spikes can be even worse and make the game unplayable. Implementing object pooling in a project can virtually remove these types of lag spikes. It does this by simply turning off an unused game object and storing it for later use. And it's really that simple. In our code, when an object is no longer needed, we'll switch it off, add it to a list to keep track of it, and then turn it back on when it's needed again. This is something that nearly every game can make use of. I'll also be wrapping the object pooling functionality into a handy super unit for quick use and reuse. So let's get started. Before jumping into the code, I'll give you a quick tour of the scene that I've set up. I've created a simple plane and hidden the directional light and camera as children to keep the hierarchy tidy. Below that in the hierarchy, I've added an empty game object called spawn point. This is directly above the plane and will be the location that the spheres are spawned. This is similar to the point at the end of a gun where bullets might be spawned in a shooter type game. I've also added an empty object that I've called object manager that will hold the object pooling super units. Then as a child of a canvas, I've created a button that when pressed will spawn a sphere at the spawn point. The last important object that I created is a sphere prefab that started as a generic sphere and I've added a physics rigid body to it. This is the object that will be spawned and stored by the object pool in this video. To implement object pooling, I'll need three scripts. One to request the object, another to return the object when it's no longer needed, and a third to do the actual object pooling. And I'm gonna get started by creating the super unit that will do the object pooling. This is the piece of code that can get reused out of the box and is the most generic chunk of code. So in my super unit folder, I'm gonna create a new flow macro and call it object pool. Before adding any code, I want to create a graph variable and I'll call it object list. It will be a list with game object type items. This list will store any unused game objects until a request for a game object is made. Since this is a super unit, I'll start with an input unit and add three input values. The first is a string and I'll call it spawn event. The second is of type game object and I'll call it prefab as this will be the object returned and stored in this object pool. The last input value is another string that I'll call return event. For both string input values, I've checked the has default value option. The two events will be called to request an object or return an object when it is no longer needed. Next, I wanna create the code that will return a game object when a request is made. The way this code will work is it will first check a list of game objects, and if there are any game objects in that list, the first one will be returned. If there are no objects in that list, then a new object will be instantiated and that object will be returned. So I'll add in a function event super unit, which I created in an earlier video, and connect the spawn event from the input to the input node. This unit is where the request for a game object is received and starts the rest of the object pool code. Next, I wanna check if there are any game objects in the object list. I'll do this by using a count items unit and seeing if the return value is greater than zero. I'll use a branch to check the value of the Boolean. If the value is false, meaning there are no unused objects, then I need to create a new object. I'll drag out the false flow and add a game object instantiate unit. I'll then connect the prefab input value to the object node. This is the object that will be returned and I'll return it by using a function return super unit, which is also created in a previous video. However, if the value is true, meaning there is an object in the list, then I'll select the first item in that list as the item to be returned. And I'll do this with a get variable unit that references the object list and a first item unit. Before the object can be returned, there are a few operations that I need to do. Since one of those operations is removing the object from the list, I'm going to use a cache unit, which will store a reference to the game object so we don't lose track of it when the object is removed from the list. Next, I need to turn the game object on with a game object set active unit. This is important since all returned objects will be toggled off by default. Once the object is active, I want to remove it from the list, and I can do this with a remove item unit 
connecting the object variable and the reference from the cache unit. The last step is to use another function return unit to send the object back to the flow macro that requested the object. I'm going to add a surrounding box to the code to visually separate it from the other parts of the code that I'm going to build next. So now I want to create the code that will allow the object to be returned. And I'll be doing this by adding a custom event unit and connecting the return event input value to the event node. I'll also increase the number of arguments from 0 to 1. This argument will be the returning game object that's going to be put back in the object pool. Next, I want to add this returned object to an object field so that I can track it for later use. I'll do this with an add item unit and getting both the argument from the custom event as well as adding a get variable unit that references the object list. Once the object is added to the list, the final step is to turn off the game object with a game object set active unit. I'll add a box around this chunk of code as well. Now there's one last step for the code to run reliably. When items are added to the list at runtime, the list grows in size. Then when leaving play mode, those objects are destroyed, but the list is not reset, so the list holds a bunch of null slots, which our code isn't going to be happy about. So I'm going to add a start event that will clear the list each time the game is played. I'll do this with a list clear unit and connecting the object list. And that's the last step in creating the object pool super unit. Next, I'll create another flow macro that will hold the object pool super unit. I'll call this flow macro object manager, and I'll also add a flow machine to the object manager in the hierarchy and drag and drop this flow macro into it. I'll then drag in our newly created object pool super unit, adding a string literal and connecting it to the spawn event node, and I'm going to give it a value of spawn sphere. I'll then drag in the sphere prefab from the project folder and connect it to the prefab node. The last step is adding another string literal and connecting it to the return event and giving it a value of return sphere. And now this chunk of code is all that's needed to create an object pool. With the default values for the events, it could be done even simpler without the string literals. It's all nice, tidy, and easy to reuse. The rest of what I want to show in this video is demonstrating how to implement and make use of this object pooling system. But before jumping into the rest of the code, I want to make two scene variables. These will be needed to make use of the object pool, as well as spawning the spheres at the spawn point. The first variable I'll call object manager, and it'll be of type game object. I'll then drag in the object manager from the hierarchy into the value. The second variable I'll call spawn point, and it'll also be of type game object, and I'll drag in the spawn point object. The next step is to create the code for the spawn button. This will make the request for the game object and move it to the correct position. So I'll create a new flow macro and call it spawn button. I'll also add a flow machine to the spawn button game object and drag in the new flow macro. Then inside the flow macro, I'll add an on button click event so the code will respond each time the button is clicked. I'll also add a function called super unit, which is yet another super unit created in a previous video. The super unit will make the request for the object from the object pool and will also receive the object from the pool. I need to give the super unit the name of the event to be called, so I'll add in a string literal unit connecting it to the event node and giving it a value of spawn sphere, which is the name of the event on the object pool super unit. I also need to tell the super unit which object the event is on. So I'll drag in a get variable unit with a reference to the scene variable of object manager and connect it to the object node. When the object is received from the object pool, I want to place it at a specific point, in this case at the spawn point. So I'll add a transform position set unit and connect the flow and return value from the function called super unit. The next step is to create the vector 3 of the position for the newly received object. So I'll drag in a get variable unit with a reference to the scene variable spawn point and connect it to the transform position get unit. And then just to make it a little more fun, I'm going to add a random inside unit sphere unit. This creates a vector that is inside a sphere of radius 1. I'll add the position of the spawn point to this random vector and connect the result to the transform position set unit. And I want to do one more thing to make this still a little bit more fun. Rather than spawn just one sphere per click, I want to spawn five spheres. I'll do this with a for loop connected between the on button click event and the function call super unit. I'll set the value of last to five and connect the flows like so. At this point, the code is testable, but since the objects are not getting returned to the object pool, it's not doing much of anything useful. So the last step is to get the spheres to be returned to the object pool. 
There are many ways to do this, and how you do it will depend heavily on your use case. For this simple example, I'm going to have the spheres return themselves to the object pool after a given amount of time. To do this, I'll create a new flow macro called sphere return. I'll add it to the sphere prefab object in my project folders. In the flow macro, I'll add an on enable event, which will run every time the object is turned on. In this case, using a start event would not work as it only runs once when the object is first created or the first time it's turned on. I'll connect a cooldown unit and set the duration to five seconds. I'll then drag out the completed flow and add a trigger custom event unit that will call the return event on the object pool. Next, I'll add a string literal unit, connecting it to the event node and giving it a value of return sphere. This string needs to match the string of the return event in the object pool. I'll also drag in the object manager scene variable so the trigger custom event unit knows which object the event is on. I need to add an argument to the trigger custom event unit so that a game object reference can be sent with the event. So I'll change the number of arguments from zero to one. I'll then connect a self unit to the argument since that is the object being returned to the object pool in this case. I'll add a box around the return code. This is the code that needs to happen for an object to be sent back to the pool, almost regardless of the use of the object. This could be turned into a super unit, but it doesn't greatly simplify the code, so I'm going to skip that step. Because of my implementation, I need to add one more unit. When the object is returned to the object pool, it can have a non-zero velocity. So I want to set the object's velocity to zero before returning it to the pool. This effectively reinitializes the object, which is something that often needs to happen when using object pooling. How you do this, of course, depends on the object and how it's being used. This could also be done, and maybe it's better to do so, after an on enable event so the object is initialized every time it turns on. With this last piece of code done, I can now test the functionality of the object pooling solution. When I click the spawn sphere button, I get five newly created spheres. This happens each time I press the button. If I wait a little bit, I can see that the spheres in the hierarchy are turning themselves off. Then if I press the spawn sphere button again, the objects are turned back on as they're reused. At some point, no matter how fast I click the button, there are enough spheres in the scene that no new spheres are being created and they're just being reused. And this is the real advantage of object pooling. For my uses, this is often all I need to do, but there's another possible improvement that depending on the use case can be a very good addition to the code. Currently, the code does not create the first object until a request is made. If a large number of requests are made suddenly, a lag spike can still occur. So one way to get around this is to create the objects before they are requested. If this is done one object per frame, or even slightly faster, a lag spike can be avoided in most cases. To do this, I'm going to go back into the object pool super unit. I'll add an additional input value. I'll call it prespawn, and it'll be of type integer. This will serve as a number of objects to create when the code is first run. I'll also toggle on the has default value. I'll then add more code after the start event to create these objects. I'll add a for loop and connect a pre-spawn input value to the last node to control how many times this code is run. Next, I'll drag out the body flow for the for loop and add a game object instantiate unit. I'll then connect a prefab input value to the instantiate unit as well. The newly instantiated object then needs to be added to the object list and turned off. Now, in order to avoid a lag spike, the for loop needs to wait a frame before creating the next object. So I'll add a next frame unit at the end of the flow. These units can only be used in coroutines, so I'll toggle the start event to run as a coroutine. I'll also add a box around this code that pre-spawns the objects. Now back in the object manager flow macro, I'll set the pre-spawn value to 10. So when I press play, 10 spheres are automatically created and can be used by the object pool. So there you go. Object pooling isn't terribly simple. It's built on some of my past videos, but it can be very useful in improving the performance of your game. So if you enjoyed this video or even better found it useful, think about hitting the like or subscribe buttons. If you want to go even further in supporting the channel, check the links to my Discord and Patreon in the video description below. So until next time, happy game designing.